I do have a word to share with you, and I believe this is, uh, I felt it's more an empowering word, a teaching word that will equip you to share boldly the gospel of Jesus Christ uh, to those that you uh, come in contact with. So just before I jump into that, uh, I want to just pray the Holy Spirit is going to empower me to lead and to share this word. Father, I pray in Jesus' name, you will use this time, Lord, the next 20, 25 minutes, speak through me, Lord, and uh, reveal your heart to them. And Lord, if they just hear me for the next 25, 30 minutes, it's going to be a waste of time. But Lord, if you choose to use me and magnify your presence through me, and they will never go back, never go back disappointed. They will be filled, but still they will be hungry for more. That is the, the oxymoron, the paradox of the kingdom. We will be filled, but we will be thirsty again because of the great love that is poured upon us. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to share this to you. It'll be a, that's why I felt it's going to be an equipping word, but also a word that's going to you know, equip you to equip others. So uh, we, in Good Friday season, we tend to meditate on particularly what Jesus uh, have said in the last 24 hours and uh, and basically, Jesus went through six trials uh, before he was crucified, three Roman trials and three Jewish trials. And it was a crucial time. He did not have his uh, sleep on that night. It, basically, the three Jewish trials, he was condemned and pronounced guilty. And that lasted the entire night. And in the morning, he was brought into... Pilate's place where he was encountered three Roman trials and in that he was pronounced non-guilty. So, but during this season, he uttered some words the scholars have put together and they're called the seven last words of Christ. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to just share that with you. The seven words are here in Luke 23, 34. So if you're taking notes, it's a good thing or you take a picture of this. Father, forgive them for they do not know what they do. That's the first one that you may see that he, he, he prays for us in the midst of the pain. The interceding son of God prays that Father, forgive them for they do not know what they do. And, and that's the first one. The second one, it's in Luke 23, 43. It says, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. That's the conversation he had, he had with uh, this, another sinner that was hanging on his right and his left. And one guy just kind of mocked at him. Another guy said, man, he made the shortest prayer in the entire Bible. Remember me, Lord. And this is what today... Uh, and this is what Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise. The third one is recorded in John 19, 26 to 27. Woman, behold your son. This is to his mother who was at the feet of Jesus hanging on the cross. And he was telling to his mom and, and John. And the Bible says John took care of her, her like his own mother, you know. So woman is not a derogatory term in those days. It is a respectful term, okay. Today, when you call somebody woman, you, you, don't, you don't call your wife woman. I mean, if you want to be in trouble, the married men know what I'm talking about. Yes, I mean, woman, bring the chutney. That's it. Chutney will be on your head. <laughs> That's it. So number four, Matthew 27, 46 and Mark 15, 34, this is a cry of God. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And this is what Arnab was praying here. When the sin of, and we read the scripture, when the iniquity of us was laid on him, even God cannot look at his face. He turned and that's the, that's the one thing more than sin. Jesus could not be away from his father. That was even impossible for him. That's the cry, you know. And number five, John 19, 28 talks about I thirst. And then 6, 19, 30 of John says it's finished. It is a Greek word called tetelastai, which has got two basically 
two words together, tetelestai, which means fully paid. It's like when you come out of the hospital, the first thing they check is the bill and they stamp and they say, yes, fully paid, you can go now. You know, it's, for, it's, a, it's a legal term. It's not a religious term. Guess what? Jesus never used a religious term. Jesus never called, uh, you know, these disciples as Pharisee, new Pharisees or reformed Pharisees. He called them disciples, which means student. And he called them apostles, which is not a religious word. It was a word that was used for governors who go from one kingdom to another king, to another place to establish a kingdom there, representing the kingdom where they come from. That's called apostles, to be sent forth. So Jesus never used any religious word. So here he makes a word, tetelestai, which basically means fully paid. That means there is nothing you and me can add to what already Jesus did on the cross. And the last but not the least, it's what he said, in your hands I commit my spirit. If you take this seven that's on the screen and you put together, you get these seven meanings of that. It's up on the screen, you can see it talks about forgiveness you know, he is the God who initiates forgiveness. He is the God who, you know, released salvation to us. He is the God of relationships. You look at it in the midst of his suffering. He is concerned about his mom. He is make sure his mom is safe in the proper place. He was not some, you know, sometimes we are so, so religious minded. We don't take care of our families. We say, oh, ministry is coming, brother, ministry. In the midst of the suffering, he is calling John and he says, hey, Make sure this is your mom. Mom, this is your son. And I want to tell you this. You know, I, I have the fear of the Lord when I tell you this. Your greatest ministry is not CMC or your any other ministry. Your greatest ministry is your family. It starts there. And then out of that, it spills out everywhere. And the fourth one, it's like, you know, it's a Eloi, Eloi, Lama Sabachthani, which is the word that we get. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Which is basically the spirit of being rejected and left alone. And many of us here can identify at some point in your life, you felt like you've been rejected. You've been You've been pushed aside. You did not conform into the patterns that people had put a mold over you and you did not. And you felt alone, lonely. The son of God went through that and distress and then triumph and then finally reunion with the father. Now, why I mentioned this because I felt in my heart to equip the body. That's one of the ministry God has given me to equip the body in such a way the body will in turn equip the rest of them. So, so this is why it's more a teaching word. You know, if you look at this, it's in the scriptures, where did Jesus day, you know, all those things, if you find it, it's throughout the gospels, you will find these were it's in Matthew, Luke, and John Mark as a very few, only one verse. In fact, but it's all spread across everywhere in the Gospels, including John. You know, in fact, John highlights more because John was the one who was hanging on the, on the, on the, on the breast, like you know. Uh, and it's incredible in in those days. Uh, if you look at their pureness of heart, when Jesus was saying, "One of you is going to betray," John was hanging on the Jesus breast. Like Manat just briefly did it on Arnab, you know, and she, and uh, and he he looked up and say, "Is it me?" Fast forward two thousand years, if Jesus was in our congregation and we happen to hang it there, and Jesus says one of you is going to betray, we're going to say, "Is it that brother who came only one Sunday that month?" I knew that already. I knew this. You know why? Because that's you're laughing because that's how we are. We are somehow we are tuned for suspicion. We are tuned to interpret for evilness in others. But we seldom look into our own hearts and say, is it me, Lord? That was John's question. Is it me? Everyone was asking, is it me? And everyone know that Judas was kind of a you know, money-minded guy, he had a money box, but nobody, their heart was so pure. They did not even point at Judas. We would so quickly to jump at someone. Oh, this guy came, come with the same girl two times Sunday. Something is going on. Immediately jump into conclusion. Immediately, you know, 
that's just an highlight you know i just wanted to bring that okay over to you and uh, let's uh, let's look at the next one uh, so i want to talk about the blood of jesus because the blood of jesus is the core ingredient of everything you know leviticus talks about the blood life is in the blood so when we receive jesus isaiah 53 says this the iniquity of us was laid on him so instead of us being punished the blood of jesus came and purified us that's why hebrews 9:22 says everything is purified with life blood and without life blood there is no forgiveness of death in another word sin leviticus 4 say the priest is to dip his finger in the blood sprinkle some of it seven times before the lord in front of the veil of the sanctuary word the word seven seven and not an accidental seven talks about perfection you know so seven times you sprinkle when jesus mentioned this is my suggestion jesus mentioned those seven words he was talking about like man i identify with your loneliness i identify with your thirst i identify with your rejection i identify with your relationship i am there to bring you into this place of wholeness now i i i, I don't know whether you can see this on the screen uh, the sweat of jesus became blood it's if if you look at it you can see in the screen in luke 22 44 the living bible says he was in such agony of spirit that he broke uh, into it broke a, into a sweat of blood with great drops falling on the ground as he prayed more and more earnestly so it's sweat and they say my medical professionals know when you are under severe stress uh, it actually there is a word for it i forgot it's a word that it's basically your your uh, uh, you, you break into a stress and it break and comes out as a as a as a blood you know jesus was going through such agony the agony was not necessarily because of the sin but because of his thought of being away from his father beaten and struck i don't know whether anyone was beaten and struck for the gospel you know the early church was gone through the thomas who preached the gospel in kerala and then died as a martyr in chennai he was beaten and struck down there many people even in this day and age are struck and beaten by for the name of the uh, gospel that they preach on you know it's in matthew 26 62 and 67 beard plucked out i don't know if anyone had anyone beard plucked out i have a daughter who loves to pluck my beard and i have salt and pepper beard so she would sit and say daddy this is white and it's not funny you know try to pluck a beard you know you will know it's it's painful i gave my back isaiah says in 50 i gave my back to those who struck me and my cheeks to those who plucked out my the beard i did not hide my face from shame and spitting back was heavily scourged the word scourged is an understatement the scourged basically the jewish scourging and the roman scourging are different jewish scourging promotes that you cannot scourge a person that means whip if someone's back less than only 39 times not more than because they believe if you hit more than 39 times you will die but the romans do not have that time limit that that countdown they would scourge sometimes until that per- person dies his his body was heavily scourged so pilate took jesus and scourged him here it was not a jewish scourging it was a roman scourging look at mark 15 15 says a pilate wanting to gratify the crowd released parabas to them and he delivered jesus after he had scourged him to be crucified same in matthew says that you know then he had pierced with crown of thorns you know that's another way that jesus shed his blood they stripped him that's a humiliation of thing jewish men especially a rabbi jesus was a rabbi he was not supposed to even show his knees they stripped him here put a scarlet robe on him when they had twisted a crown of thorns they put it on his head and read in his right hand and they bowed its mockery this is sacrilegious they mocked him and said bowed the knee before him and mocked him and then he was crucified which is another whole topic by itself where they would pierce him in such a way that he would stay there crucifixion is one of the most 
painful death invented by the Romans for any person who is guilty of crime to die slowly. It's a very crazy thing. And then last but not the least is his side was pierced out of one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear and immediately blood and water came out. Now, now I want to talk about the amazing benefits of the blood of Jesus. That's why I want to teach you in such a way, not only you receive it and impart it. And most of you, when I say this, you will have a resounding yes and amen in your spirit because you have walked the path with that. But my prayer is that you will take this and you will continue to share it with those who don't know Jesus. Because people may say, man, why we need Jesus? You know, they may accept Jesus. We are not talking about accepting Jesus. We are talking about believing in him and following him. So the first one, the blood of Jesus forgives me from all my sin. What is a sin? Sin is a God's, you know, original design that you miss it. It's called sin. You have been, you and I have been forgiven through the blood of Jesus shed when he gave up his life. Without shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. So put your hand on your heart and say, God, I thank you for forgiving my sins. I thank you for redeeming me from death to life. I thank you for bringing me from darkness to light. You didn't earn it. God did it in your heart. The blood of Jesus forgives. Through the blood of Jesus, what happens when you walk through the blood of Jesus? You can walk with greater freedom. Amen. That's, that's the highlight of this blood of Jesus. You can walk with greater freedom. Amen. So the, the next one, the blood of Jesus cleansed me. You know, sometimes we feel so dirty because of impure thoughts or something weird comes to our, you know, some conversation we got into and we feel like, man, what is this? And the Lord says in Hebrews 9, 14, our consciences have been washed by the blood of Christ Jesus. That's why when you sit with the gossipers, they're trying to gossip, ah, oh, this pastor, that pastor, that doctor, this one, this brother, this, this person, and your Holy Spirit is saying, ah, oh, man, this is very weird. Don't join it. But eventually you end up joining and the consciences, and then you go to God, God, I feel so dirty after this complaint and gossip. And the conscience have been washed by the blood of Jesus Christ because we have truly been purified from all sin. Amen. So the blood of Jesus, through the blood of Jesus, I can walk with no guilt. What a freedom God gives us. Number three, the blood of Jesus redeemed, redeemed me. Amen. Forgiven and cleansed we find that we have been redeemed from the clutches of the power of darkness. Now we are redeemed. We don't belong. You know, sometimes people say, I still have my, uh, you know, family traits, uh, family inheritance of all the curses. No, that's been broken in the name of Jesus. And if you are believing that, today you have to say in Jesus' name, the blood of Jesus has redeemed him. In Ephesians 1, 7 says, in him we have the redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the rich God's grace. Amen. So what happens? But through the blood of Jesus, I can walk with the father as his child. No religion, guys. This one thing can take next 40 minutes to explain and to talk about it. We can walk with the father as his child. Put your hand on your heart and say, I belong to my heavenly daddy, God. I am his daughter. I am his son. He cherishes over me. He created me for his pleasure. May, we may know it here, but we have not experienced fully because we are so corrupted by things around us. And the Lord is emphasizing again, the blood of Jesus. I can walk with the father as his child. Number four, the blood of Jesus justified me. That means you don't have to go and explain yourself. Look at 2 Corinthians 5.21. He made him who knew no sin to be the sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. What a beautiful thing. I am justified. That means I don't have to go and defend myself. And I felt sometimes some of you are here, you feel like you have to defend for yourself. God is going to fight for you. Amen. If you are that person, say amen on the chat. God is going to fight. I will walk with no condemnation. God is your fighter. God is your you know, strength. The blood of Jesus sanctified me. What is the sanctification means? That he has set apart. 
because narrow is the gate, difficult is the way which leads to life, and there is few who find it. Sanctified, that means God may even stir up some of you that there are certain movies you cannot watch. There are certain people you cannot hang out with, not because you are holier than them, but it's just because God is setting you apart as his bride who can experience his pure love that shed over you and through you into the nations. Amen. So the blood of Jesus, through the blood of Jesus, I can walk in holiness. And holiness is not something you do. Is holiness something is who you are in Christ. And that's what Jesus' blood does. When he bled made you holy, you are made holy. So when you are holy, you don't touch unnecessary things. I give this simple example when I teach on, when we go in DTS and I tell about holiness. Holiness is like when you are preparing to go to a nice wedding, you have your suit and your nice silk sari and all your jewels, makeup, everything, fair and lovely half kilo is on your face and the perfume and everything, you know, and about your leaving the house and your mom says, uh, pick up this trash bag that is filled with all the fish bones, take it and throw it in the trash. You will not touch it. Why? Because what you carry on you cannot afford to do those things. So you are not sin conscious. You are more God conscious. So the blood has made me worthy. I cannot afford to look at a woman in lust. The blood has made me worthy. I cannot afford. Come on, I'm preaching good. You say amen. I cannot afford to gossip. The blood has made me worthy. So I cannot talk bad about another brother of mine. The blood has made me worthy. So I cannot just go and gossip about others. The blood has made me worthy. I cannot afford to lie. The blood has made me worthy. I cannot walk in bitterness. The blood has made me worthy. I cannot afford to do things because it's not me trying to become holy. The blood has made me worthy. Amen. So some of you here, you feel like saying, God, I need to do be more holy. And maybe you had a teaching saying, you got to be more holy. You can never produce holiness. The blood has made you holy. The blood has sanctified you. The blood counted you worthy. Now you walk in what you have already put on you. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. I, I, I just want to camp here for a few minutes, but it's so powerful. Some of you are striving, striving and striving and you are like going like this and then you feel like, oh man, I did this. And then you're coming back. No, just when you are covered by the blood, the blood has made you worthy. You don't need to go and defend people and say, oh, this is my right. I did this. No, he will try. You know, when we got in an accident in October, in November, actually, and this is the word God gave us. My mercy will triumph over judgment. Because the amount of hospital bills and everything, and we are like, oh Lord, what is this going to happen? We are holding on to the promise. The, my, my mercy, his mercy is going to triumph. Amen. The blood of Jesus. Let's keep going. The blood of Jesus brought me peace. It was in Colossians says, through his son that God cleared a path for everything to come to him. All things in heaven on earth for Christ's death on the cross has made peace with God for all by his blood. Say this with me. Through the blood of Jesus, I walk with the Prince of Peace. That means you are not going to get involved in disputes. I'm not saying you're going to turn your blind eye and move on. But when challenges comes, you're going to say, you know what? I choose not to afford to lose the Prince of Peace with me. You know what? You want to talk about, argue? You can go ahead and argue. You want to fight? Go ahead and fight. You wanted to talk bad about me? Go ahead and fight. But I am not getting muddy in the battle. Ravi Zacharias used to say this. When you spit, sleeping down and spit, you're going to do two things. You're not only spitting up in the air, you're going to, the same spit is going to follow on, on, on your face. And that's my prayer. Don't walk, don't get into people who wanted to always fight, always trying to get, find they are right. You know what? They can be right. Let it go. Prince of Peace is with you. Amen. Hallelujah. The blood of Jesus gave me access to the throne. 
Look at this. Hebrews 10, 19 says, So dear brothers, now we may walk right in the holy of holies where God is because of the blood of Jesus. Can you imagine that? Only the, only the high priest, not even a, you know, yeah, yeah, the, it has to be a right reverend doctor only can go inside in those days. Now you and me can go. Amen. Who are you? A blood has washed me. I am a son of God. I am a daughter of God. The veil has been torn. You know, the, now you walk straight into this holy of holies and you have an access to the throne. Hebrews says uh, that come boldly to the throne of grace. Who sits on the throne? He's not a religious God. He's a king. Amen. Through the blood of Jesus, I can talk to Papa all the time. Have you talked to God? You don't need a mediator. You don't need to say, please pray, brother. Here is my 100 rupees. Pray. And 200 rupees family combo offer. You don't need to do any of those things. You just go before the Lord. Access to the throne. I'm not saying you cannot ask people to intercede for you. That's part. But you can never put somebody else in, in as a middle person to mediate for you. That was in the old covenant. The children of Israel did to the Moses. He said, Moses, you talk for, to God for us. But here God said everything free. Amen. The blood of Jesus, you can walk directly. I mean, I've said this before. The blood of Jesus removes all curses. I mean, Exodus 12, 7, 12, 13, it says, you know, put it on the sides and the door tops of the door frames of the houses where they eat the lambs. This is about the curse, the angel of death. You know one thing about this? It's so interesting. The angel of the death does not look into the house and say who is worthy, who is eligible. He just looks at the blood is covered. You know what? You don't need to worry about your father's sin, grandmother's sin, great parents' sin, your Indian curse sin, your, your caste sin. You don't need to worry about it. The moment the blood of Jesus come over, all the curses are removed. I speak that over you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Say this with me. The blood of Jesus, through the blood of Jesus, I can walk with assurance. My past has been dealt with. I don't know who this is for, but the spirit of God is telling me to tell you that your past has been dealt with. Your past of shame has been dealt with. Your past of tears have been dealt with. Your past of rejection has been dealt with. Your past of all your turmoil has been dealt with. God is removing those curses. He has removed it 2,000 years ago. He has removed it. Now you walk in the assurance. Hallelujah. The blood of Jesus speaks of better things. Can you imagine this? Sometimes when you sit with people, they don't talk better things. What do they tell? You, you sit with some people and you leave that room, you feel more depressed. I want to prophesy over you. There will be a spirit of discernment will come upon you that when you with sit with people, that you will be the channel of speaking better things. Hebrews 12, 24 says, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Today, God wants to say to you that my blood, because of my son's blood upon you, you have an inheritance. You will have a greater revelation of his glorious kingdom. You will walk in the fullness of God's original design. My plans that I have for you is greater than your imagination, your thoughts, your minds set because i am the god who speaks better things amen look at someone and say my god speaks better things about me amen hallelujah thank you jesus the last but not the least some of you are saying anna said 20 minutes is more than 20 minutes i'm going to be finishing now the blood of jesus protects me and heals me look at this verse you know it says put it on the sides of the tops of the door frames in Exodus. And the same night, the angel of the Lord comes over and brings a destructive plague. Wow. And Isaiah 53, we read this verse, because of our rebellious deeds, he was pierced. And because of our sins, he was crushed. Look, he's swapping our place. He endured the punishment that we should have, we should have got it. We could not have endured it. We would have been dead. That made us completely whole. And in his wounding, we found our healing. You see, my dear brothers and sisters, the religion teaches you salvation from the world. Jesus taught salvation to the world. 
<laughs> Jesus never said, oh, pray that you will come with me. Pray that my kingdom will come where you are. Don't say, God, take me out from the situation. Say, God, kingdom of God, come. Will of God, happen in my place. Amen. Through the blood of Jesus, I know that I can walk in, I am in safe hands with the Lord. Amen. I want to I wanna stop here and I want to pray with you. Are you there? Amen. I want to pray with you. I saw a few hymns here. Beautiful. Father, I pray for each and every one who are here, Lord. Let us take this word. When somebody asks us, why are you celebrating Good Friday? It is the day you, your Savior got killed. You call it Good Friday? That doesn't make sense. Your God was killed by a Roman people. The religious people. And you call it good and you tell them, because of his blood, I am worthy. Because of his blood, I am cleansed. Because of his blood, I am washed. Because of his blood, I am sanctified. Because of his blood, I am made holy. Because of his blood, I am forgiven. Amen. Father, I pray for my brothers and sisters. They will walk in the fullness of this revelation. Here are some announcements. If you have missed any of our sermons, you can watch them by logging in on Papa's House through YouTube, SoundCloud, iTunes and Facebook. We have a family support program where we support single mothers and their children by getting provisions, through finances and opportunities to earn a livelihood through small businesses. Every Friday, through our homeless feeding program, our team prepares and distributes food packets for homeless people in and around Velour. We would encourage you to join us in this program by either preparing or distributing food packets and also by considering making your generous contributions through your finances. If you consider yourself to be a part of Papa's house, then we would encourage you to send your tithes and offerings. But if you are visiting Papa's house for a few occasions and led by the Spirit and you feel that Papa's house has made a difference in your spiritual life and your connection with Christ, you could consider sowing a small seed through an offering. We would make sure it falls on the good soil so that it reaps a good reward from God. You can find the details of the bank accounts and Google Pay should you decide to send in your offering to us. We will intimate to you once we have received it. Also, here are the links on how you can reach and follow us.